Hello again, welcome to our second video for Energy 101. I'm excited to be joined by Professor Elizabeth Wilson, who is the Director of the Irving Institute for Energy and Society. And she'll be talking to us more about the role that energy plays in our lives and what we mean by energy transitions. So let's get started. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm Elizabeth Wilson. I'm a professor in environmental studies and the director for the Irving Institute for Energy and Society. This is our third or fourth year doing Energy 101, and we're just so excited to have the opportunity to engage again on this topic that we all care so much about. So let's start at the beginning, since this course is Energy 101. Can you tell us a little bit about what energy is and where our energy comes from? This is a really good question because how we as a society have used energy has really changed over time. I mean, energy is something we get from the food that we eat that allows our bodies and any organism to, to function. It's something we've used from the earliest days, from fire to cook food. Um, and how energy intersects with society, of course, changes over time. Um, from the earliest days of using human power or animal power or, or wood, and then later renewables, like the, the windmills in Persia or in Europe that helped to drain the water. That was a use of energy to, to mill grain, to um, drain the swamps in the Netherlands. Um, energy has taken on different forms in different times in different spaces. For the last century, the use of fossil fuels has really allowed humans to free up a lot of human labor, a lot of animal labor, and use fossil fuels to provide that energy instead. So when we think about heating our homes, when we think about transporting ourselves and our goods and our services, when we think about running our factories, it really has a, in a large part been this shift from a wood-based economy to a fossil fuel-based economy that has allowed society to develop as it has. I always joke that I'm here as a professor, as a woman professor, because of electricity and birth control. Um, where we really have a, a, um, a new way that society is organized where human labor isn't as much spent in preparing food, in refrigerating food, in providing uh, washing services for, for the home, and can now be spent in more professional endeavors and, and ways to kind of engage in society in very, very different ways. And I guess I'd like to also point out that while we talk hear about how energy is used um, in our own societies and what I'm familiar with in North America. I've also lived in East Africa and I've lived in Asia. And I appreciate that wherever you are in the world, you have a very different energy story. How energy is used for heating, for home cooking, how energy is used for transportation really depends on where you are. And I think a lot of us are, are guilty of, of thinking that the energy system we're sitting in is the one the whole world's used when it actually couldn't be farther from the truth. Great, thank you. That was a, a great introduction. So one thing I'd love to hear is what a little more about the role that energy plays in our lives and maybe how is that different on sort of our personal individual scales and, and a society scale? So when you think about energy in your own life, I always have students kind of list all the ways that their lives that morning have intersected with the energy system, whether it's you know making a cup of coffee in the morning or turning on the light when they get out of bed or taking a shower, hopefully with warm water um, or taking the bus to school or even riding their bikes to school or walking to school. Um, and when we think about it in our personal lives, it's easy to think about the energy that we use to drive to the grocery store or to fly in a plane to see our grandparents over the holidays. Um, but it's not always as easy to think about the energy that's used in the industrial infrastructure that supports our lives, the energy that's used to create cement or create the asphalt for the roads that we drive on, the energy that's embodied in the cars or bicycles or computers that we use, the energy system that support not only our residential and commercial lives, but also the industrial sector and the global transportation sector. And so this idea that energy systems are inherently local and very personal, but also global and shaping not only the global economy, but also the global environment is something that I think makes energy so satisfying to study and so satisfying to engage with intellectually as well as physically. Thank you. Um, so you just talked about kind of the, the global scale of energy. Can you tell us a little bit more about how energy use differs right now in, in different parts of the world? So there's about 
2 billion of us in the world that have, I always joke, we have too much energy. When we flip the lights on, the lights go off or the lights go on. <laughs> when we change um, our energy systems, um, we have a reliable energy infrastructure to support us. We have heat, we have cooling. When we have an expectation that when we want energy, it's there and it doesn't bound our activities. Um, we often talk about the 1 billion people on the planet that don't have access to electricity. It's about 2 to 3 billion that don't have access to modern cooking fuels. And for those people, not having energy affects everything about their lives, how they move themselves, if they have lighting at night, how they're cooking their food. And then there's about 4 billion people in the middle who have energy in their lives. It may not be reliable, it may not be enough. It may be affecting when their factories are able to be open or not open. And that era of kind of energy shortage and not having enough energy affects how many, if you can have your iron and your light on at the same time, it affects how we use our energy in our, in our lives. And it's that section of the world, those 4 billion people that are driving energy use in the decades to come. All right, thank you. So you've talked a little bit about um, how our energy use has changed over time um, and, you know, how that is, is a little different in different parts of the world. Um, can you define what, what we mean by energy transitions and, and tell us a little bit about what energy transitions um, look like today? So when I teach ENVS 12, I always use this book by Hope Jaron called The Story of More. And chapter 10 is about energy. And she talks about the last 50 years and how we use three times as much energy now than we did in 1970. We use four times as much electricity. And so even though people are living a little bit longer and we are living longer, um, our energy use has increased threefold. And so when we're thinking about energy transitions, you're thinking not only about how we use energy, but also where we use energy, where the energy comes from, what services we're using for energy, cooling, heating, uh, refrigeration, home services like washing machines, but also our industrial services, our computers, our data centers, our Bitcoin mining. And so our energy system is, is something that evolves with our economy. It evolves with our technologies. It evolves with our very different discoveries. And in every part of the world, even every part of the country, it looks really different. If you're living in rural New England, um, your water may be coming from a well, and that well uses a pump. So when you lose power, you also lose water. And so that's an energy system vulnerability that people in the cities don't have, where their water system and energy system are, 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 are part of bigger networks. Just to add to that a little bit, what's kind of driving the um, energy transition that we're going through right now? I think our energy systems have always been changing. They've never been kind of stasis, even though we like to pretend that this has been a stable period. When you look at it in reality, we've always had different technologies coming online. But now the, the real driver and recognition that our energy systems are contributing to a changing climate has led countries to come together to try and significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions to respond to climate change. I would say at the same time, in addition to reducing emissions, you're also looking at the need to adapt our energy systems to the changing climate that we're feeling, whether it's from hurricanes or droughts or fires or other types of strange weather events or flood-like conditions, our current energy infrastructures have not been constructed for the world we're moving into. So right now there's a simultaneous force of creating energy systems that emit fewer greenhouse gases and fewer pollutants. And at the same time, adapting those infrastructures in a way so they can survive this very different world than the one they were originally brought into. Thank you. Okay, so um, what are some of the, the biggest challenges that are related to our energy use right now, um, particularly as we go through these energy transitions? I think where you sit is where you stand. I mean, there's great articles all the time about in California, they're having this problem. In New England, we're having this problem. In Texas, we have that problem. In India, they have this problem. And so one of the examples is by, by putting more and more renewables like solar PV on rooftops, then you also have to change how the distribution network works. You have to upgrade the transformers. You have to change how you operate it. When you put more variable wind 
on our high voltage system, we need to change how our markets operate. We need to change how our transmission lines are built. We need to change how our, our energy finance work. When we're thinking about technologies like offshore wind, same sort of thing. We need to think about what types of fleets we need to service those offshore infrastructures. We need to think about transmission lines coming online. When we're thinking about um, uh, electrification of our transportation sector. You need to think about providing charging infrastructure. We need to think about how those systems fit together with the energy system we already have and what we need to do to change it to allow for those new innovations to be part of our futures. Great, thank you so much. Um, so before we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to add? One of the things that I've really appreciated is no matter where you are in the world, energy is part of your story. And no matter where you are in the world, energy takes a slightly different shape and it takes a slightly different color. So your energy system and your legacy energy system, the history of where you are, um, really help to define not only how you use energy today, but also how you think the future possibilities should evolve. Um, there's a lot of places in the world that don't have private ownership of energy systems. There's other places in the world that feel themselves really uh, vulnerable to interruption of their supply because of other countries around them. There's other parts of the world that have a very strong market ideology that believes in this is the right way to do things. And so everywhere you go, the story of what energy is, the story of what makes sense to evolve in different ways is a little bit different. But one thing that is facing us all right now is the risk that our energy systems are under with our changing climate and the need to reduce emissions. And so while the, the, the contexts are slightly different and the way forward may be slightly different, the goals I think are more shared now than they ever have been before. And so when we're talking and thinking about energy and energy infrastructures going forward, we're thinking about not just providing energy, but providing enough so people people can live sustainable and robust lives. Thank you so much to Professor Elizabeth Wilson for joining us. In our third video for this week, Dr. Amanda Graham will be coming back to talk to us about the very important topic of energy justice. We'll see you there.